This is the Louisiana Forestry Association. 1947, we were organized to reforest Louisiana. 75 years later today, we are celebrating the success that we have accomplished, but we're not done. Today we're learning more about some new industry moving into Louisiana that will utilize our, our forest resource. And people that are here today have missed the last couple of years getting together because of hurricanes and, and COVID. And now we're coming together, celebrating our 75th anniversary and also celebrating the great future that we have in forestry in Louisiana. Forestry is one of the largest agricultural industries in the state. It covers half the land area. It employs more than 50,000 people and generates in the Louisiana economy every year in excess of $13 billion. And most important with forestry, it's in rural areas. This gives young people and old people as well opportunities to remain in rural areas, earn a good quality of living, and enjoy the benefits of living in rural Louisiana. Timber is infinitely renewable and also very carbon positive. If you look at the timber industry as a whole, the timber industry in the United States sequesters 18 to 20 percent of all the carbon produced. The timber industry, again, 18 to 20 percent of all the carbon produced in the United States is consumed by the timber industry in its trees. So it's very valuable and infinitely renewable resource. The economy and what we've seen with several new sawmills being announced for Louisiana. Well, that, that's a big part of our economy. Overall, when you start looking at value added to that, so adding those sawmills puts more value into the timber that is on the farm. So it again, puts more money back into our Louisiana economy. But that's where we're going to get the wood to build for the future. As you saw, you know, lumber prices got up to $1,700, $1,800 per thousand because there was a shortage of lumber. And now we're recognizing that. So you can see sawmills, you can see pellet mills, you're going to see energy facilities, all looking at this natural recurring resource. And again, everything we do with timber absorbs more carbon from the atmosphere. Biggest issues ha have been attracting industry really and some of the speakers have helped spread the word of all the good that is going on in Louisiana. I mean we have a great resource, we have a great workforce uh, training those folks making sure that they're all ready and willing and able, which I think they are, able, willing and able, they just need those opportunities. And those opportunities are coming forward right now and the future is very bright. People don't realize that every, every year there are uh, people out there planting trees. And in Louisiana, we plant about 75 million trees for future generations. We're not planting them for today, we're planting them for tomorrow, our children and our grandchildren. So we believe very strongly in sustainable forestry, that it's important that we're always growing trees to attract the industry and to make sure that we always have future employment in our forest industry. We got some new markets coming to Louisiana that we're, you know, all the landowners are excited about. Will help things. Yeah, there's some new solid wood uh, facilities coming, uh, really all across Louisiana, uh, Southwest Louisiana, and North Central Louisiana. We've got some new sawmills coming online, uh, or, or have been announced to be constructed. Uh, should be coming online in a couple years. So it should help, should help the, the landowner with you know with their final products. Oh, it's a huge. It's one of the uh, the main agriculture products in the of the state. It's uh, one of the biggest job producers in the state. Uh, you know. That's a huge tax revenue uh, for the state of Louisiana also that comes from that. So uh, it's a very important commodity. Hunt Forest products, uh, historically we have our plywood mill in Pollock, a little hardwood mill there in Ala, Louisiana, and then our first joint venture sawmill uh, at LaSalle, at Urania, Louisiana, LaSalle Lumber Company. And then the new facility, uh, the Imbel Lumber Company, be 33 miles west of Ruston. That's um, where our corporate headquarters is there in Ruston. Um, again, right about a mile south of I-20, uh, really nice corridor straight into the Texas markets. So why Taylor? Um, 
Most of you know that the, there was a Woodward Walker Lumber Company lumber mill, plywood mill there on this site for years. So here's the map of all the, all the competition. I will say that uh, at the time, Teal Jones, I put this map together, Teal Jones had not announced in plain dealing, but uh, that should go up uh, near the, the Arkansas border there, just north of us. But you can see from a converting capacity standpoint, there's just not a lot of capacity in this geography. Um, our Urania sawmill was in a clustered around Dotson, Wind Lumber, and, and West Fraser there in Joyce. And, um, you know, we're able to log that mill and certainly should be able to log the mill at, uh, at the Imbel. The forest, uh, there's, a, there's a, a lot of raw material there. Um, and, you know, we're estimating 1.3 million. These are some very conservative estimates. Obviously, um, we're, we're consuming about a million tons at LaSalle right now, so a, a two-line sawmill is going to be a little bit more than 1.3 million. He has 40,000 40, loads of logs annually, 800 loads a day, and about 80 to 90 loads of residuals per day. You know, why build a, a mill in Louisiana? Uh, I see Liz McCain over here, the Department of Economic Development is certainly um, an outstanding partner. The incentives that they offered, including the Fast Start program, uh, they provide all of the job fairs for us, they do a lot of training, and the incentive package is certainly something that, uh, that keeps us home here. And this is our backyard, so we're, uh, we're certainly glad to stay here. So this is the old Woodard Walker site. Um, this is the exact site that we're building on, and for those of you who ever have built a, a brownfill mill, you know back in the day there's a lot of uh, hidden treasures right underneath the soil. And, We've uncovered just about every one of them. Uh, that's the site as it looks today. Um, you see a lot of dirt moving, um, some gravel going down. That's the finished good warehouse, which will be the first concrete pour and the first building up. That will serve as our laydown yard for all the equipment coming in. Um, and that's a, a little bit better picture from away. You can see this is looking east. Um, you see the Highway 80 overpass in the top left. And that's the entrance of the mill. The, in, the log truck, finished lumber trucks, and residuals, they will enter down by those warehouses all the way at the top left of your screen. This, was, this is a community that has traditionally had wood products facilities on this site. And so it has been dormant now for probably 15 years. It's, uh, they, they closed the mill there. So I think the, the economic impact to the area, to Bienville Parish, to North Louisiana, is going to be tremendous. Tell us, so why did you select Louisiana for this investment? Well, we have deep roots, roots here. Hunt, the Hunt family has been in, in North Louisiana Piney Woods since the late 1800s. And so we know Louisiana, we know this area, we know the geography, and we want to give back to this state who have given, they've given so much to us over the years. Our intuition was, uh, you know, we were kind of looking at what we wanted to do was that there was a whole lot of wood down here. Um, and the second part to that was that uh, we, knew, we know how to make wood, but we don't know anything about Louisiana. Um, so when, uh, you know, Tom and Dick were, were, were thinking about this, um, you know, we looked for, uh, you know, uh, some partnerships, some, some boots on the ground, some local knowledge. And uh, the mill we're bu building and plain dealing, um, you know, we're, we're doing that in partner with, uh, you know, the local community and, and a lot of the local timberland owners. Um, so we think that's really cool because, uh, you know, it, it, it gets us, uh, uh, you know, more connected, uh, you know, uh, with, with the region and, and gives the folks um, some more visibility into the sawmilling process who, you know, are growing all these trees and the ability to participate in that upside too. So, and uh, that's something we're actively looking to repeat, uh, you know, across the south, uh, not just Louisiana, um, but Louisiana has been a great place. Uh, we have uh, eight saw lines, um, you know, bought and on the ground that we need to put somewhere. So if anyone is interested in, uh, you know, hashing out, you know, maybe there's something else in Louisiana we should be looking at, uh, I'd love to catch up with you on that. So our company is building a sawmill in Plain Dealing, Louisiana. Uh, we're a Canadian company, the Teal Jones Group. And we figure we're going to take about 150 uh, loads of uh, timber a day. Tell us, why did you select Louisiana? We love the people in Louisiana, you know. Uh, fantastic people, fantastic parish, fantastic state. Uh, there's a lot of timber here. 
we see a great opportunity and uh, we think there's a great workforce. We're probably going to employ directly 160 folks and maybe a 320 folks in the woods uh, um, and indirect jobs. So. What kind of jobs are those? Uh, other great jobs, you know. The, um, they're, I would call them kind of uh, advanced labor jobs. They're not kind of, you know, close your eyes and, you know, uh, slug a shovel around. Um, you know, they're, they're going to be well-paying, um, uh, you know, working with optimization and, and PLC and, uh, you know, computer, computerization of heavy equipment. So it's pretty cool stuff. How difficult is it to recruit employees? Um, that's always the key, right? You're nothing without your, without your people. So, uh, you know, one of the things we like about Louisiana is that there's a great workforce. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're always looking for good people. First, I want to appreciate the, um, the opportunity to speak here about what we think is a very exciting project. And we're very excited to be here in Louisiana. Um, our project is Louisiana Green Fuels Project. It's in the, at the Port of Columbia in Caldwell Parish, which is about 30 miles south of Monroe. And um, there are three reasons really why we're in Louisiana. So first is the reason that you guys represent, which is the trees are here, right? And the trees are here in abundance. The second reason is that we are um, doing carbon capture and sequestration. So we're gonna, we're gonna, out of our process, we're going to capture the carbon dioxide that's produced and we're going to put it about a mile underground, uh, the bulk of it. And the geology in Louisiana is really ideal for that. And then the third thing really is the legislative and regulatory framework in Louisiana. And I, I know when I've talked about the project other places and I say that um, the Louisiana legislature was visionary, a lot of times people are in, going to shock or something but Louisiana's legislature really was, and back in 2009, they began to pass laws about carbon sequestration with the idea that Louisiana is an energy producing state. And we're very for forward looking in saying that Louisiana wanted to be in the forefront of that, um, of that move, and they began to pass laws to facilitate it. And actually, there really are only seven states in the whole country that have taken any kind of move like that. And I will tell you, Louisiana has the best laws uh, for what we're trying to do. So I start out with carbon capture and sequestration because the economics for what we're doing really rely on that. In the absence of that, it would not be a great investment. But because of that, it is, and I'll show you why. Second thing is we're going to make renewable diesel fuel. And we could make um, what's called sustainable aviation fuel or jet fuel. There's a lot of press about sustainable aviation fuel. And we would make that, um, except we'll make about a dollar a gallon more for making diesel fuel. And we have an agreement with one of the two largest truck stop operators in the country to take all of the fuel, all of the credits that are generated and move the, um, move the product in their rail car fleet to California where it gets the most current value, although we could go other places if the market changes, but they will move it there. And so basically we'll make the product, they'll take it away and pay us for it. So great um, economics for us. And then we're using forestry waste. And so that's a combination of for making fuel we're going to use first and second fittings. Okay? And the EPA defines those as waste. So it qualifies for us a lot of different things. The other thing is we're going to produce about 85 and a half megawatts of bioenergy, biopower, from primarily sawmill waste. Okay? And we're going to start out, um, target is the plant up and running at the end of 2026. We're going to need about a million tons of thinnings and a million tons of sawmill waste in that first operation year. And our goal is over the next 10 years to get to the place where we're doing um, a total of 5 million tons of thinnings and 5 million tons of sawmill waste. So we think that represents a really good opportunity and this is the place to do that. I look at what is it that we're doing and why are we doing it. 
Well, if you start off on the kind of on the le on the um, side with the fossil fuel plant. Imagine this is in California or the West Coast, or actually uh, could be in Canada, which is putting in regulations that go into effect uh, December this year. Um, and they are all put in limits on how many emissions they're allowed to make for CO2. So they've got a, a ceiling. And if they put out more than that, they have a couple of choices. One choice is to go and spend the money to fix their plant and reduce the emissions. Problem is, a lot of these plants are 70 to 100 years old. Okay? And the cost of retrofitting those is just exorbitant. So one of the other options is for them to buy credits from ultimately someone like us that would offset those emissions. The other alternative is shut down, and generally they don't want to do that. It's not very good for your economics. Okay, so, so it creates this need for carbon credits that are offsets. And then also in these states, there's a need for these renewable fuels, which is what we will produce. And everybody in this room understands that what the trees are doing already are pulling the carbon out of the air. Okay? They're returning um, oxygen to the air through photosynthesis, but they're building the cellulose, that carbon structure with the carbon that's in there. Well, I want to tell you, every single atom of carbon that we're going to either convert to fuel or that we're going to put a mile underground started out in the atmosphere. So every day we would run, we would actually remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, really starting with the process that the trees do. So what we're doing then is two things. Okay, we're taking that starting out with a million tons per year of sawmill waste and generating the, the bioenergy to run the whole facility. That's what it takes. We won't need any other backup energy just except when, if we go down. Okay? And then we're going to take the thinnings, first and second thinnings, and we're going to make that renewable diesel fuel from that. We're going to make about 32 million gallons per year. Okay? And all of that is going to target California initially. It's going to leave us, um, leave the site by rail and go out to California. And we don't have to sell it because we've already sold the credits and the fuel to the truck stop operator. Oh, before I go that, we're also then going to take the carbon dioxide that's produced. There's some of it produced in the fuel processing and a lot of it produced in the, um, in the production of the power. We'll produce a total of about 1.4 million tons a year of CO2 that we're going to put underground. It's about a mile underground. It is literally like the best place in the country where you could do this. And um, again, that's why we're here. Now, I just want to show you what it's worth. And a lot of people don't understand the value of renewable fuels. People talk about renewable fuels, but all renewable fuels are not the same. So over on the left-hand side of the chart, there's this kind of goofy number, carbon intensity, grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule. Okay, that's, that's the number, that's the technical thing, but it basically works out to where if you're gonna make diesel fuel, it, imagine that it's 100% of the carbon footprint. Okay, natural gas, people talk about nice, clean natural gas. Well, that's 88% of the carbon footprint of diesel fuel. If I put coal on here, coal would be 140. And the thing is, there's this push to do electric vehicles, right? Well, California's got the cleanest, well, one of the cleanest electric um, grids in the country, not the cleanest. But if you fill up your electric vehicle on the California grid, your carbon footprint isn't zero. It's just that the emissions were produced at the power plant that made the electricity. So that would be 23, okay, which is good. But if you fill up your electric vehicle in most other states, your carbon footprint's about 88. Okay, so what have you done? If you fill up your electric vehicle in West Virginia, it's 140. Okay, it's worse than regular fuel. So some of the things just don't make sense. Okay, there's a whole set of what are called first generation renewable fuels. I got a beat. <laughs> okay. First generation renewable fuels are things like ethanol and soybean oil and um, 
and tallow, so animal fats, or um, used cooking oil. Okay, and they're good. The best of those would be used cooking oil. The thing is, there just isn't much used cooking oil out there. If you look at second generation renewable fuels, which gain more credits, quite a bit more valuable, okay, those are like municipal solid waste or forestry. So I want to show you on this chart, if we use the forestry waste, <laughs> okay, working on it, all right. If we look at the forestry waste, you see it, the 23 for carbon footprint, that's the same as the California grid. So if we just use the trees, that's where we would be. But because we capture the CO2 okay, from all of our process and put it underground, we're at minus 294. All right, there we go. I like that one better. All right, so the thing is, with the federal credits, you get the same number of There we go. Okay, so if we, um, if we, for the federal credits, you get the same number of credits as long as you get a certain depression of the carbon footprint, so by 50% for what we're doing. But for the California credits, the lower that you go in carbon footprint, the more credits you get and the more valuable that they are. So looking over on the right-hand column, you can see that Ultimately, because we're at this minus 294, which is nearly a 400% reduction in carbon footprint relative to regular diesel, we're at about $8 per gallon that we would get. Now, some of that money goes to the truck stop operators, some of it California keeps for themselves. As I said, the, the driver for this is the carbon sequestration. So out of the first $5 million that we raised, we spent four to drill the test well that was required to demonstrate we could actually do it. Okay, because otherwise it really didn't matter. And we found not only was it good, it was way better than what we thought. And so we validated that, yes, we can actually do this. And just to show you the economics, okay, that um, we will earn about $19.5 per gallon from this. Now, interestingly, the fuel itself, it's 87% diesel and about 13% naphtha, which will get the naphtha gets blended into the gasoline pool. Uh, forecast is it's only worth $2.20 a gallon. You can see the rest of it is credits, either federal or California. And there's a um, federal sequestration tax credit um, up until a few days ago before the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it would have been worth about $1.99 to us. But with the stroke of a pen, um, that revenue increased to $3.64 per gallon. So without us doing anything, for us, that works out to nearly $50 million a year of increased revenue as a result of that legislation. Whether you agree with the legislation or not, it's a benefit to what we're trying to do. This is what the plant looks like. Uh, this is based on the engineering design work that we've done. The power plant is up in the upper left-hand um, side. The bulk of the plant, you can see, is the conversion process. Uh, somewhere along the line, somebody will always say something like, oh, you're doing what Kior did. And it's like, well, yes and no. Okay. Um, what Kior was trying to do, they were technology developers. Okay. We aren't technology developers. At the core of the process, or you make the fuel, or the, what's going to become the fuel, we went out and, and, in fact, with everything that we're doing, we went out and licensed it. Okay, so Kior was a small company trying to make their own way with technology that had never, ever worked for making truly renewable diesel fuel. This is true synthetic diesel, just like synthetic motor oil is still motor oil. Okay, and, um, and we licensed the technology from BP. BP is a good producer of technology. Okay, and um, so the plant is going to be built by Coke Industries and guarantee, so they'll, they'll guarantee the, the cost of the plant, they'll guarantee that it works. A few things that we're here in part looking for. So um, one is information. So um, to get all the credits uh, that we can possibly get, we have to ask, answer some questions for the California Air Resource Board. Uh, turns out, Probably not surprisingly, they don't understand the forest industry in Louisiana whatsoever. 
Okay. They don't even understand the requirements under the federal renewable fuel standard. All they understand is California. So they want to know things like, well, what's happening to the residuals? Okay, are they burning? Are they decaying? You, you might think originally that, that them burning would be a big deal and, and worse than decaying, but actually to leave it on the forest floor and decay produces methane, which is 16 to 25 times worse for the greenhouse gas than burning it. Okay. Well, we can use all that material in what we're doing, so we can kind of pull it all up, but they want to know what's happening. Okay, then what's happening to the thinnings? Are they going to the pulp? Are they going to pellets? Are they decaying? There's, in our particular region, not much demand for the thinnings at all. And then, uh, is Louisiana forestry sustainable and to what degree? And then we have this other thing that's interesting, and we are actively looking for this as well, which is feedstock um, supply security. Uh, the city is a, Citibank has agreed to provide all the debt for the project, and um, what we're looking for is like options or contracts on stumpage out in the future to secure some of that. Um, we're looking at contracts or options for sawmill waste, and we're looking for assurance that the loggers who would be involved would be certified sustainable logging. So with that, I'll stop. We're planning on building the project in Caldwell Parish. Uh, we'll use about a million tons a year of thinnings and about a million tons a year of sawmill waste. We're building a 85 and a half megawatt wood-fired um, power plant and then a 32 million um, gallon per year renewable diesel plant. Tell us a little bit about uh, how unique this plant is in Louisiana. Sure, so it's unique in that we are going to capture the greenhouse gas, the carbon dioxide that's produced from the uh, fuel production and also from the power production and we're going to permanently sequester it about a mile underground. So there's a formation deep underground that where the forces that have held oil and gas there for millions of years will hold that CO2 permanently underground. So it is a, a, a novel um, application of technology that's been around for many, many years. We looked at the economy of forest products for Louisiana and for the South, and a couple of things that we found were, that one is the U.S. South in general is really well positioned to meet the needs of the lumber and housing markets for the U.S., and Louisiana is part of that story. It's part of the reason we've seen a lot of capital investments in new mills. We're growing more wood than we're using here. It's a great opportunity for economic development. And then you look at all the bioenergy sector activities, and Louisiana is pretty well positioned. Timber markets are uniquely local. So this is a map of the south broken into 30 different markets and the northwest broken into seven. So when we do multi-clients, these, the, these are some of the markets we're working with. So I wanna, I'm highlighting this map for two reasons. One is that if you look at the markets in the south, so these are units that we're analyzing right now. You will, you will be looking at, you will, right away, I know you're, you're saying, well, my mill is in market whatever, or my timberlands are in market numbered whatever. And, and you're thinking, that's not really my market. And you're correct, every mill's individual wood basket is shaped differently. Every timberland owner's timber market is shaped differently. However, what's interesting about these markets is the way they were constructed. So we took all this data about how wood flows and where it's bought, and what we did is we drew the lines where the breaks are in the wood flows and the pricing. So when you cross actually from one line to the next, there is a statistical difference between the level of cost at the time that we did this. So regardless of what an individual firm's wood basket is, there are breaks in the marketplace that are driven by things like topography and roads and distance and the relative positioning of the forest and competitors. If you look at the, at the markets up in the, left, in the upper left-hand corner for the Pacific Northwest, those are seven markets constructed the same way in coastal Oregon and Washington. And you'll notice that they all seem to follow this sort of robust line on the right side. I mean, on the left side, it's water. So we're not procuring a lot of wood in the water. But on the right side, it's the Cascade Mountain Range. So this is just, it's a set of markets basically in a sock. They're in a tube, right? They're stuck. So these physical realities do affect and drive how wood flows. So it is important to be mindful of these natural infrastructure and these natural breaks in the market. Lots of mills in the south, a lot of new investments. The panel following me is, gonna, is representing a lot of the capex in the region. I, I highlight this because 
if you, I've, I, like, I like this map because I feel like I can show it 100 times and it looks the same to everybody, but if we did that game where you flip the pages and you can see like the person running in the corner, if you do that with this map, what you see is lots of changes every year all over the place. And uh, what's interesting about this map is it highlights great investments in sawmills in the U.S. South. There's four ways to expand lumber capacity. One is you open a closed mill. Two is you expand an existing one. Three, you add shifts. Four, you build a new one. All four of those things have been happening in the South for the past 10 years. Uh, they've been happening a lot in, in this region as well. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight some of these when I, when I come to a growth to drain char chart in a second. But what you'll see is you see all the colors. And when you see all the colors, it means all type of exp ex uh, capacity expansion activities are taking place. So now we're combining the previous two maps. So just, we literally produced this map a couple weeks ago. Now what this map highlights is it highlights the growth to drain across the south. In other words, where are we growing more wood than we're harvesting? Where are we growing more wood than we're harvesting? Where you see darker green, where we're growing a lot more, where you see really, really light colors, we're harvesting more. So let's, let's highlight uh, the, the, uh, the person of the moment, which is the state of Louisiana. You see a pretty nice profile there, right? You see pretty balanced wood. We have some nice surplus in the northern parts of the state. This, e this even accounts for Hurricane Laura effects, so that's important because Hurricane Laura did put a dent in the forest. That was material. Just like Hurricane Michael put a dent in the forest in southwest Georgia and northern in the panhandle of Florida and southeast Alabama. So we have to do that math to see, well, how much of the pie do we take out of the system? Because when you take a dent out of the forest, not only does it affect the supplies you're banking on for this year, next year, and the year after, but when, if you wipe out seedlings, you're talking about the future forest or young pre-commercial stuff. So you gotta, you gotta estimate those numbers. So this accounts for that. But what you see is you, you see pretty good, pretty good supplies. This is why people come to the south. Why is it when housing does this, the southern lumber capacity does that? This is why. We have all this lumber. We've got new mills coming into the state. We've got capacity expansions coming into the state. Timberland deals, when I highlighted the big growth in the Timberland transactions occurring in the south between 2020 and 2021, a big chunk of those occurred in Louisiana, East Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, so right around this part of the, the Gulf South region of the, of, the, of, the re of the South. Inflation's kind of a tricky, but it's an interesting story. It's an easy headline to read where you see prices are going up, costs are going up, and prices are going up. And the thing about inflation is it affects different inputs in different ways. So when inflation goes up, sometimes timberland values go up as well. Lumber prices go up as well, so that's good for the mills, even while costs are going up too. What type of jobs are available at these plants? So we have a, there's a range of manufacturing jobs available, and I know some of the toughest roles to fill are the trade roles, the plumbers, the electricians, those kinds of things. But these are full benefit, full-time jobs. They're, it's quite exciting for the region. I appreciate everything that the logging industry and the forestry, forestry industry is doing for the state. It, it, it doesn't miss us that how important it is, especially across the state, you know, it's bringing revenue and uh, bringing jobs to the state, and it's very much appreciative. And I think if we can work together, we can, we can just continue in, in, towards our goal, and our goal is always going to be in safety. The logging industry in Louisiana has come a long way. Uh, the trucks are better, the equipment is better. I think hats off to you for getting the permits passed and getting the weights raised. I think that took a lot of pressure off of, off of both of us. Uh, we're only, we can only enforce what the law is for. And when it was 86.6, all the violations were in the 90s. And now that we have this 92,000 permit with the wood chips added to it, it's, uh, I think it alleviated a lot, of, uh, a lot of stress on you. Hopefully it did. The phone calls have definitely reduced. So hopefully that's, that's helping. Uh, equipment's good. I think if there's one thing that we have to watch out for is that the ones that want to be in compliance are in compliance with that 92,000 permit. The ones that are trying to be exactly uh, 92,000 on the nose, the, the new norm for being overweight is, is now in the hundreds and just a regular conventional 18 wheeler. So, uh, I mean, just be mindful of that. Uh, I think y'all are doing a great job at policing each other and letting each other know about uh, what, you, what you should and should not do. So uh, hats off to you for that crash mitigation. I mean, it, it comes as no secret that, I mean, you can see these billboards across the, across the interstate, across the corridor when you're coming down here. Louisiana is, is, is tough on commercial traffic when it comes to uh, litigation. Uh, 
I think it, it, it's on average of about, you know, even large truck crashes, the average is about $91,000 per crash. And I, I don't even know if that, now that number seems a little low to me. Uh, there's a reason why you see all those advertisements because they know that there's money involved in it. So you just got to try to be, be as, as mindful of that as possible. Uh, by being safe, uh, a couple things you can do, just driver education. We can do some driver, uh, we, we'll do some driver uh, safety presentations to try to get them mindful of how they need to behave. Uh, a lot of companies are moving towards cameras, you know, that, that's kind of a, they're not as expensive as they used to be. You can uh, buy some dashboard cameras, they got cameras that look out the side, so I mean, if, the, if you have any issues with, with crashes, and I think even, you know, just recently we did a presentation for some guys out of New Orleans and they're purposely running into them, so that, that was something that they were looking into doing to try to, to stop some of that. And you know what happens when you reach the next summit? there's another summit. And when you conquer that summit, there's another summit. But you guys in Louisiana have conquered a lot of summits and uh, have a lot to be uh, very grateful for. I can tell you in my travels across the United States that there are many states that would love to trade places with Louisiana and the good things that you guys have going for you here. So sometimes it's hard to see the forest through the trees when you're in Louisiana and you're facing these challenges but from my perspective, and uh, traveling the country, I can tell you that a lot of people would love to have the opportunities that you have in Louisiana uh, with your new mills and other things that are happening around here and your uh, associations that are representing you. As challenging as it seems today, it's a new opportunity, an opportunity to discover new ways to conduct business, new markets, new images, the birth of tomorrow's timber industry. Together, we will get through these challenges and be stronger. This is the theme of our meeting in Branson. The future belongs to the next generation that's coming up in this industry. And we need to make sure that they have the same opportunities that you had um, with your timber industry. I'm with the American Loggers Council. We represent 38 states, including Louisiana. Um, so it's great to be here with our members and uh, talk to them from a national perspective about what the American Loggers Council is doing. We're seeing a lot of challenges across the nation that are similar um, from state to state. But uh, you know, one, one underlying theme to it all is that things are changing and uh, we need to embrace that change and uh, move forward with it and look at it as an opportunity. What are the biggest issues facing uh, loggers in Louisiana? Well, Louisiana is very fortunate. Um, as I, I've been to 29 states in the last 15 months, and I think most states would trade places with Louisiana today uh, to be in the position that Louisiana is in with their um, governmental support, uh, with their with the interest in new markets and uh, new mills being developed here. Well, we're seeing in many parts of the country mills are shutting down. Um, Louisiana is very fortunate to have a, a, a growing uh, industry. What is it that we do with Louisiana Operation Lifesaver? Uh, we uh, empower the public to make good decisions around railroad tracks. So what we want is for everybody to be educated to make sure that when you're approaching a railroad crossing, you make good, sound decisions. You look both ways, you make sure there's not a train coming, and then you safely go across the tracks. Uh, we're a non-profit for public safety education, and uh, we're dedicated to reduce crossing collisions. We want to work with everybody. So it takes every industry, every community. Uh, you know, I'm with the Union Pacific, PB here's with BNSF. We all have to work together to make sure this works. So we got to get everybody involved uh, because nobody wants to go home and hear about a collision and a fatality and somebody getting hurt. We want to make sure everybody gets home safe every single day. So, and the third thing is we do free safety crossing presentation. So whether it's 10 minutes, 30, 45 minutes, we can set up a time to come to your business, to your school, to your industry, and do a free presentation to share this safety message. So we're going to go through that today. My name is P. B. Rivera. Uh, full name is Philip Baron Rivera, but I go by PB for short. Uh, why do we do this? Well, we do it to, uh, to save lives primarily. Uh, because every three hours, Either a person or a vehicle gets involved in a train collision. Uh, unfortunately, some ends in uh, injuries, uh, some in deaths, uh, but regardless, it affects everyone. Uh, 
2015, we were number, uh, we were fifth in the nation for, uh, for casualties. Um, fortunately, 2021, we're now number eight, but still, that's not a, um, a good number. Uh, just to give some backdrop, uh, for 2021, we've had 79 collisions, uh, nine deaths, and 39 injuries. And uh, as far as trespassing incidents, we're number 13 in the nation for, uh, for those incidents. Uh, for example, uh, out of the trespassing incidents, we had 23 casualties, 13 of those are deaths, and 10 injuries. So as an organization, Louisiana Operation Lifesaver, we're committed to providing these educational services and resources necessary to help our local communities resolve this problem. Any time is train time. Uh, railroads do not operate on the schedule. As a matter of fact, I work a lot with my law enforcement counterparts. And when they give me a call, I said, hey, PB, when's uh, such and such train is coming by? My answer is usually the same. It's uh, I don't know because uh, we don't have a, a train schedule. Uh, trains operate on tracks at any time. So there's no specific time, uh, day or night, that trains can come through. So uh, approximate speed and distance. Um, usually when I present this, uh, this particular slide, it usually, uh, the car will show up and then the bus, the tractor trailer and so on and so forth. I would ask uh, each member about the stopping distance for a vehicle uh, traveling at 55 miles per hour takes 200 feet for a car to stop. And then I would ask uh, if anyone would guess, what do you think the stopping distance for a school bus would be? And I would get a range of answers. Most people are surprised that it takes only 230 feet for a school bus to stop at 55 miles per hour. For a tractor trailer, it's 300. For a small community train, it's 600. And for a freight train uh, carrying approximately 100 cars, it takes about 5,280 feet. Uh, if, it, if there are any mathematicians in the, uh, in the group, 5,280 feet, if you convert that to mileage, how, how far is that for? Who says one mile? Raise your hand. That's right. Catch. Thank you. That's, that's, that's right. 5,280 feet is one mile. If we would convert that to uh, football fields to kind of give you a, a visual represent, representation. How many football fields is one mile? Any guessers? Three guesses. Anybody say two football fields? More than two? Okay. Uh, ten? What's the number? It is 18. So, congratulations. So, 5,280 feet equals one mile, which is also equivalent to 18 football fields. So, that's, imagine a train traveling at 55 miles per hour. Unlike a vehicle, that, that's how far it takes for a train to stop, so trains can't stop on a dime. Or the danger. Know how to spot low ground clearances at railroad crossings. They look different depending on what kind of vehicle you're in. If you do get stuck, get out of your vehicle immediately. Call the number on the blue and white side and give the crossing ID number. All kinds of vehicles need to be aware of low ground clearances at railroad crossings, not just trucks and buses. Always look for the signs, because ultimately, it is your responsibility to ensure you can clear the crossing safely. Remember, trains always have the right of way. If you're not sure the vehicle you're driving can clear the tracks, find an alternate route. Use the Federal Railroad Administration's Rail Crossing Locator app to plan ahead. It'll save you time and could save your life. Always expect a train. See tracks, think train. We're representing Louisiana Operation Lifesaver. And we're here to educate people about railroad crossing safety. And uh, we our, our mission is to make sure that everybody gets home safe. So make sure nobody gets injured, gets any kind of crossing collision, and gets home safe. What is the biggest issue when it comes to train safety, particularly with uh, logging trucks? So the biggest thing there is um, close um, clearance to where they, um, they don't fit all the way on the other side of the crossing and they get hung up. Um, uh, hump crossings where they get hung up on the crossing itself and, and they are, they're locked in where they can't actually move. 
and then just trying to beat the train. Be cognizant of the uh, warning signs. Uh, there's warning signs as you approach the uh, railroad crossing to be aware of it and to heed the warning signs. What are the biggest causes of uh, uh, train accidents? Inattention, I would say uh, not paying attention, uh, inattentiveness, um, impairment, uh, and, um, and uh, just being rushed, uh, not having enough patience. And you can tell by your meetings that there's more and more interest in all types of natural resources, especially timber. We must constantly remind each and every person outside of our circle, timber is the largest industry, plant-based industry in Louisiana. Right now, your Office of Forestry, we have 179 positions, currently eight vacancies, 179 strong. So about 50% of the state's land, about 15 million acres are farmed timber. Remember those words, farmed timber. And support, man, I just love flying across the state. I can look out and I can look at those tracks. And what do you see? That's green, right? And what is green? That's money. 18% of the carbon produced in the United States is sequestered each year by our trees. $3.6 billion. That's another key number. We need to make sure, and I want to thank the Ag Center, I want to thank your organization, everyone, for putting this information together. So that our policymakers, politicians, I can say that because I am one. Or what is that, I are one, right? I are one. But they need to hear that and understand that. We'll never lose the forestry industry in one fell sweep. It'd be like by a thousand nicks. 148,000 landowners. That's 148,000 influencers. Think about that, that own this timber. And again, we protect 18.9 million acres of wildfire. There's only 27 million acres in Louisiana. The timber industry is strong, it is growing, and it has a bright future. What would you like people to keep in mind about the importance of timber to Louisiana? It's our number one plant-based industries and one of the largest industries in the entirety of Louisiana. Forest Products Mills today want to make sure the wood they receive comes from a sustainably managed forest. The American Tree Farm Program is an important part of that because not only do these tree farms help maintain that supply of wood for mills to make all the great products that we use, they provide a healthy habitat for wildlife and help keep our water clean. A vital part of this program is our tree farm inspectors. If you're a tree farm inspector here today, please stand and be recognized. <clears throat> Thank you for your help. We appreciate it. Tree farms in Louisiana under the American Tree Farm Program total more than 1,600 and cover over a half a million acres. Each year, we honor one of those tree farmers as our tree farmer of the year. I want to thank Daniel Rush and Robbie Hutchins for helping me judge this year's contest. This year's winner is the Louisiana Ecological Forestry Center, formerly known as Hodges Gardens. Good afternoon. I want to, uh, my name's Will Hodges. I'm the president of the AJ and Nona Trigg Hodges Foundation. So on behalf of the foundation and our family, I want to thank you all for this award. Um, you know, we don't do what we're doing for awards, but it's certainly a nice uh, affirmation of the hard work and the effort that everyone's put in place. AJ and Nona had identified a tract of land. They, he was a fairly large landowner in that area in the Sabine and Vernon Parish in West Central Louisiana. And they identified a tract of land that was about 4,700 acres and it had an old rock quarry on it. And they made a decision that they were gonna move and, and live in that location. And they were gonna create a, a garden, a gardens in the forest. And their, their original intent in creating that was not to, um, I don't think they intended to open it to the public. But over time, I think there was a, a clamoring of people to understand what was going on there and their vision changed and they opened that they opened the gardens they created Hodges Gardens and opened it to the public and at the same time they created a foundation and over time that foundation really became the governing body for the gardens and 
for really in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we had a very robust um, operation. People wanted to see flowers. There's probably a lot of people in this room that had been to Hodges Gardens and had seen the beauty and, and what it was like. And when you have 100, 120, or 130,000 visitors coming through every year, you can support a botanical gardens. But in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, that interest started to wane. I-49 got built, 171 wasn't the uh, thoroughfare that it used to be, and it became really a struggle for the foundation to operate the gardens. If anyone in this room is considering opening a botanical gardens, come see me and I will save you millions of dollars. So you've heard the saying, how do you, how do you make a million dollars in the oil business? Start with two. How do you make a million dollars in the botanical gardens? Start with nine. So it is a very, very difficult thing. And so we made the difficult decision, or we, we partnered with the state. We gifted it to the state in a cooperative endeavor agreement. And I'm, Dr. Strain, you might have been in the legislature when that deal was cut. Um, and we all thought it was going to be a really good endeavor. <clears throat> What I give the state credit for is determining in 10 years what it took us 50 years to determine is it's a very, very difficult operation to run. And so they decided to get out of that business and, and reverted it back to us. But in the, when we gifted it to the state, we had to determine what are we going to do and where are we going to go. And that's where Andy comes in. So Andy had been the, uh, when, when my grandfather, Andy's father, passed away in the 70s, Andy became the president of the board and then moved on and took, kind of took a back seat and allowed the next generation to come in and run the foundation. But Andy came back on and had a vision for what we could do with our land and what, we could, what that land could be and uh, how we could move forward. Because as a foundation, we still had to operate. Just because we weren't running the gardens anymore, we still needed to do something. And so for the longest time, that's when, when Muslow's group came in, Muslow Forestry came in, we used that ongoing thinning operation to fund and offset the, the, the financial losses we were having as gardens. Well, now that we didn't have to support the gardens, we could look at things differently. And our vision really got moved away from the approach that Steve had presented and, and really moved into more of a multi-generational, long-term approach to how we operate our, found, our forest and where we, where we take that. And so in the late, I guess the late teens, eight, 17, 18, 19, when we took the gardens back, it was about the same time we hired Rodney. And really we started to um, refine our vision and, and move it in towards, you, you heard us say, a diverse ec ecological uh, ecology with a, long, with a, with a focus on a uh, longleaf dominated system. And, but it's always been important to us as a, as a foundation and how we operated to not be closed in, to not be internally looking, but how are we open to the public? We wanted this to be something that everyone could benefit from. And so when, when Rodney started creating these uh, programs, we want to create outreach. We want to do research. We want to look at things in a different way. And we want to make sure that while we're doing that, we're making sure that we're working with landowners, that we're working with the state universities, and that we're working with industry come in and say, hey, we're trying new things. We're going to do some different things. We're going to take a multi-decade approach so that my kids, grandkids, Andrew's grandkids, Evan's kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, so that in 75 years or 100 years, we're still uh, moving forward as a, uh, as a forest and as a foundation. And so um, we want to be open. If you all want to be involved in something we're doing or you want to get information, reach out to Rodney. Um, we welcome that. We want to be a part of that, and we want to make sure that we're doing things that are creative, forward-looking. We'll try some things. They may fail. They may succeed. That's kind of our, our grandfather, great-grandfather's legacy, and that's the same approach we're going to take. So I thank you all again. Um, thank you for the award, and I'll close with that. Thanks. He's not only been a big supporter of forestry, but in many aspects of healthy managed forests, the education of students who are learning and just entering the industry, as well as education excuse me, educating anyone and everyone about what sustainable forestry is all about. He has been a big supporter of our loggers and helped with the formation of the Louisiana Logging Council. And by supporting the development of building and expanding markets in the state so that landowners can earn the resources to grow more trees, so that loggers can practice their profession in providing raw material to mills, so they can provide goods to people, so that people's lives are better. And when we say a big supporter, we mean that in a sense of our industry as well as literally for the past 
40 years. Please join me in thanking Buck Vandersteen for all his hard work and dedication to the LFA. We'd like you to come up. We've got something for you. You got to come up here. So while he's making his way, I will, I will read this plaque. It's a beautiful plaque. And it says, in recognition of 40 years of continuing service to the Louisiana Forestry Association, marked by integrity, honor, and outstanding dedication, presented to Buck Vandersteen by the Board of Directors and staff of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Thank you, Buck. Michael, yeah, I do. That's not on the script. That's not on the schedule. So, what a what a wonderful honor. Thank you all very very much for this. It's uh, I can't believe it's 40 years. I'm still here. I'm still planning on on staying and representing such a wonderful group. How can anybody leave such a great group of men and women? and industry and loggers and all that make Louisiana forestry so great. And our Commissioner of Agriculture and Forestry and all of our state officials, our federal officials, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you do and for this wonderful, wonderful honor. I will cherish it forever. Thank you. All of this new uh, industry, this new excitement brings uh, a tremendous interest in this conference. We have over 600 people coming through this conference in, in the last couple of days and uh, the excitement there, the future is bright and we continue to move forward. It is a sustainable resource so they see a log truck going down the road and know that those trees were harvested for uh, you know for the good of the public you know for various products and that they, they, they're those those the area where those trees were harvested were replanted uh, for future generations. How can people get more information? Come to the Louisiana Forestry Association website. Most people go there, uh, www.laforestry.com. Uh, we have a magazine too if you like print material. That's another way of doing it. But uh, we have social media. We have our phone number is 318-443-2558. Call us and let us know how we can help you be a better manager of this great resource that we have here in Louisiana.